Well, good day, students. This is a very short lecture over John Locke and his importance when it comes to his ideas about the state of nature of man, education, and political philosophy. And I just want to give you an overview of the map of Europe currently in this period of history during the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, that is the 1600s to 1700s AD. Some of the areas that we're going to be mainly be focusing on would include here with Great Britain, here with France, and just let you know where Holland is, is right here in this area with the Netherlands in particular. This essentially is the hotbed of the Enlightenment period itself, these three locations in particular. And then we're going to be focusing uh, on France next with how the Enlightenment affected uh, French thinking. Uh, we're going to be talking about men known as philosophes, uh, and these are going to be French philosophers. Uh, that are influenced by the time of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment itself bleeds into the French Revolution itself. They are influenced by the ideas of men like Locke and Hobbes and many others as well, too. And they'll be having great debates about the role of the absolute monarchy and the government that's in place and about the freedoms and liberties of individuals. Very similar with regards to the American Revolution. They're having similar conversations as well, too. But this is the hotbed right here on the map dealing with Great Britain, France, and the Netherlands, or Holland here in particular. All right, so we're going to talk about John Locke, John Locke here today. And uh, I just want to give you a brief overview of his, uh, his life and his importance uh, when it comes to political philosophy and how his ideas contrast with Thomas Hobbes. So he was born in Rington, England, and was named King's Scholar and awarded a scholarship to attend Oxford University. That's also the same place where Thomas Hobbes attended as well, too. Now, originally, he went to school to become a doctor. He studied medicine, and uh, this was his uh, original purpose. And he's going to still be essentially a doctor throughout all of his life. He's still going to retain all this medical information, and in fact, will come uh, to be very important later on, actually, to cure someone's uh, liver condition as well. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, he did become a government official and was officially charged with collecting information about trade and colonies. And so uh, you're going to find that throughout much of his life, he's not going to only practice medicine, but he's also going to be involved in many other different kinds of work as well. For instance, uh, being a governmental official, collecting information about trade and colonies for the uh, English government itself. Now, when it comes to his philosophy, he usually focused on the idea of the individual, kind of similar to Thomas Hobbes. He also looked at individuals as well, too. And he looked at the state of nature, which knows no government. That is, the nature of man itself does not naturally seek out a government, some sort of organization or authoritarian figure to be over it. Hobbes would argue that Man's nature from the get-go is to not seek out order either to a certain extent, but rather it is to seek out pleasure and to seek out safety. Now, eventually that's where the concept of the social contract comes into play for Hobbes, where he believes that in order to uh, achieve that, he will give up some of his freedom to have that safety and give it into an authority figure. Locke here also believes that man does have a state of nature and it doesn't know government from the beginning. Now, he believes that each person, when they're born into this world, they come in with a blank slate, uh, a tabula rasa. That is, there's no information recorded on it whatsoever. They come in without any belief. They come in without any knowledge. And so the, from the moment they are born, they come into this world from their mother's womb. That is when they begin attaining knowledge through experience and through the environment that they are born into. So all knowledge and all understanding comes through experience and reflection. And a, a much of this will be taking place through the use of your senses of sight, of touch, of smell. All five of them uh, will be utilized to attain knowledge itself. He also believes that humanity itself, when it is born, comes out neither good nor evil. And this is going to be in stark contrast to the uh, Christian belief of the day 
where they believe that man is born naturally evil, that he is born into a sinful condition, uh, that he is unable to uh, escape from on of his own power, and that he needs to have uh, a divine intervention to bring forth uh, salvation from that sin itself. Locke takes a different approach here. He doesn't believe in that Christian concept of, of sin with regards to the sinful state of man. Uh, that is a Christian concept would be that the state of nature of man is born to a sinful condition and need a divine intervention to be uh, remedied of that condition. But rather Locke sees man is neither good nor bad, comes in uh, with uh, no knowledge, no experience, uh, essentially uh, is uh, neither. Uh, and that based upon the experiences and the environment they are born into, that is going to determine whether they are a good or a bad human being. It is the environment and the choices and decisions they make through the experiences that they have that will determine what kind of human being they will uh, they will be. And this is where Locke really has his uh, assertions about education to parents that parents need to be involved with their children, that they need to nurture them, they need to be tender towards them, be kind toward them, so that children would understand how to practice these same virtues as well and pass it on to their children eventually. In order to make a good people, Locke believes you need to have good education. You need to have good parents educating their children on how to be a good human being. You're going to notice that that's something that we do very similarly in our school as well, too, is teaching you how to be a good human being through our virtues of honor, respect, perseverance, all of these uh virtues we discuss about daily and say each morning, we we say them to help remind you of what it means to be a good human being. We teach you through this form of education how to become a good human being, to have that human formation, if you will, of virtue itself. So he believed parents should be involved and they should have this tenderness and kindness with their children. He also believed that rulers and governments are obligated. This is in stark contrast to uh, Hobbes, who believes that government is not obligated to the people, but Locke believes that a ruler or rulers and the government itself, they have an obligation. They have a responsibility to protect the natural rights of the people it governs, that the people are born with certain rights, that the government cannot take them away, and that the government is there to protect those rights so the people can practice them freely. And that's going to be Locke's belief about liberty. Liberty is about being able to practice your natural rights without restriction itself. If this government or ruler were to fail in its obligation, its responsibility to protect the natural rights, the people then have the right, and he would even say the responsibility, to overthrow that government. Now, this is radical for the time period, saying that if the government doesn't fulfill what it's supposed to do, then the people are then obligated and have a right to overthrow that government and install a new government. Now, this is radical for, uh, for monarchs of the day to hear this kind of talk here because they believe that they have divine right to rule and that the people themselves, they cannot make the choice and decision for who should rule over them. They need to have a divinely, uh, not divinely inspired, but a divinely placed individual to rule over them and to make decisions on their behalf. That'd be a bit more of a Hobbesian approach there. But Locke here says, if the government doesn't do what it's supposed to do, the king doesn't do what he's supposed to do, get rid of them. Get rid of that government. Create a new one or replace that individual. The best government is one which is accepted by all of the people and which has limited power. Hobbes believed that a monarch should have absolute power. Locke believed that you can have a ruler in place, but they can't have all the power. It must be shared. They have to limit how much power they have. Locke himself was actually uh, favorable of the English monarchy, having a king rule over the people. However, he believed that the king should not have all the power. He should be limited in how much power that he has. And so he believes that a limited monarchy is the best form of government to have. He believed that all people were born with three natural rights. Rights of life, rights of liberty, and rights of property. You can notice that this line sounds very familiar to Thomas Jefferson's line in Declaration of Independence regarding life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we're going to talk about this in greater detail later on with regards to the difference here, these two, of property and pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness is a bit more expanded. It is the ability to pursue whatever brings happiness to your life. 
for some people that would be property that is the attainment of land or that could be the attainment of certain objects uh, but jefferson expands it further is it's per the pursuit over whatever brings you pleasure in your life that is a right that you should be able to pursue after what brings pleasure brings happiness to your life now as i already mentioned here he uh, it was very influential on thomas jefferson and Locke justified revolution in the eyes of the founding fathers of the United States of America. They're going to look to his ideas for it. They're going to see the king of England abusing his power and abusing the rights and the freedoms and liberties of the colonists. And this is going to give them uh, their basis for belief that they should be able to uh, justify revolution and break away from parliament and from the king of England as well. He also influenced later revolutions in France in 1789 and in many other places in the world in the 19th century, that is during the 1800s. So his ideas go on to be very influential. People will, will uh, bring, bring forth to life his uh, political ideals. He also is known to have said, man hath by nature a power to preserve his property that is his life, liberty, and estate against the injuries and attempts of other men. That is, he has a right to protect what belongs to him. That is his life, that is his liberty, and his estate, what he owns materially. He has a right to protect it against the injuries of and attempts of other men. All right, so to finalize here, just a brief overview, whose ideas are right? Well, we have two very different political philosophies here. Hobbes believed that people are selfish, self-serving, and brutal. Locke believed that people are reasonable and able to make decisions, that they're born not naturally good or evil, but it's their environment and it's the experiences they have and the knowledge they gain through those experiences that determine what kind of people they will become. And he believed that people can be reasonable and they can make their own decisions. They don't need someone to make decisions for them. Hobbes believed that people need to be ruled over and that he needs to make decisions for them to have freedom, to that is not to be, have other people uh, indulge in their selfish uh, and evil impulses. Hobbes also believed that without government control, society itself would be chaotic, that you need to have a strong ruler with strong law to restrain the impulses of the people. Locke believed that people should be able to rule themselves and that they should be able to make their own choices and decisions. All right, that is a very brief overview of John Locke and a comparison here of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Please make sure you take care of that uh, big question comparing the ideas and philosophies of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. You can utilize this part of the video to help you with that, but also make sure you use your textbook to answer that question. If you need any help, please let me know and have a great day.